Wormholes, particle physics, extra dimensions. Are the wonders of so-called reality really what they appear to be? Or do we exist in an elaborate hologram? Is our universe the result of random activity or the result of intelligent design? If a creator was involved, can we discover him through our perception of divine order? This is Into the Multiverse with Josh Peck. What can the stars tell us about prophecy and uh, how does the Bible relate to all this? There's actually quite a bit of astral prophecy in the Bible, surprising to uh, myself when I first learned about this and uh, most Christians I would imagine today. In studio with me, my lovely, beautiful wife, Christina Peck. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well, thank you. Fantastic. And he's <laughs> already laughing. I was gonna say, it's really good when your wife is doing well. <laughs> yeah, it helps. <laughs> Our guest, um, Dr. Michael Heiser, who has written the book Reversing Hermon. Hermon? What's, the, what's the proper... How do you oh. properly say it? I always just say Herman, but I don't think that's... Uh, it sounds like Herman Munster, then. It's yeah. Just... <laughs> Hermone. 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 Reversing Hermone. Yeah, a fantastic book. I had an opportunity to read uh, an early advanced copy. I don't know what you would call it, but I had a chance to read it. Phenomenal stuff. Uh, I also read Derek Gilbert's, uh, which we'll, we will be doing episodes with him as well, but we'll record those at a different time. We don't want it to be too much like the Skywatch TV programs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's get right into it. So okay. uh, before we start, there might be some people who this is their first time watching the program. Where can they find us online? Hey, you can find us here on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash into the multiverse. Uh, you can also find us on skywatchtv.com. You can scroll down and there'll be a picture of Josh and I with the into the multiverse logo. You can click on it. It'll bring you right here to the YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you have Roku, check us out on Roku on the uh, Skywatch TV channel. Absolutely. Yes. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, and if you do, you'll have all past, present and future episodes. You'll also have the episodes we recorded uh, earlier last year mm -hmm. with Michael Heiser on cosmic geography and uh, ufology in, in the church, which is yes. both really interesting topics. But today, astral prophecy. I'll, I'll give you the first question, Christina. OK, <laughs> uh, you talk a lot of about astral prophecy um, relating to the birth of Jesus in your new book, mm -hmm. Reversing Hermon. Um, for the viewer. How is the Bible's use of astral prophecy uh, different from astrology? Well, that's a good question. You're going to get that all the time when you bring this up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, astral prophecy, really, I think even broader, most ancient, you know, use of the stars, you know, to you know, sort of predict things or, you know, tell stories and that kind of thing. This is not, as I like to say, this will date me. This is not Miss Cleo. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, you know, I'm looking up at the stars and it's going to be talking about it, determining my individual destiny and fate and all that stuff. Who should I marry? You know, what car do I buy? Right. Uh, it's, it's not that at all. Uh, the, the belief was in the ancient world that the stars were either divine beings. Again, they don't have a knowledge of astronomy like we do, but either divine beings or they were under the power of divine beings because they moved, they changed positions. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now for, the, for Jews, and th there's a lot of this in, in early Judaism, which surprises people, but you, know, you can find this even on the internet if you, you know, look up Zodiac Mosaics in Jewish synagogues. Okay? Right. There are whole books mm -hmm. written on that. Um, it, they're, they're, they're not that hard to find. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls have astronomical you know, slash astrological texts. But the idea for a Jew, a faithful Jew, was that, well, you know, Genesis tells us that it's God who made the stars mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he made them to designate times and seasons. And th that's just another way of saying, well, the stars have something to do with the progression of time and the progression of history. And so God is in charge of that. And so therefore this whole connection with celestial events, celestial objects to a faithful Jew, that meant that, okay, if we look at the, st at the stars, if we look at the heavens, that might tell us that God is up to something. Mm -hmm. It might be telegraphing some, you know, thing that God is going to do or God is up to, you know, something like that. So it, it was a way to, to credit God for, with being in charge of the progression of time and history. Uh, it, it wasn't, you know, about individual destiny. That's actually why most Jews and most uh, early Christians 
rejected the concept of pagan astrology because that's what the pagan astrological stuff was about. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Dictating fate and individual destiny. So someone who was, you know, we'll use the term a Bible believer mm -hmm. in the ancient world, rejected that idea because only God determines individual fate and individual destiny. It's not about what's going on in the stars or whatever. I mean, God does something up there because he made that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the idea that those things, those objects are the ones that, you know, map out our future, you know, give us, you know, our, our destiny was offensive, again, for very obvious reasons. Right. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Revelation 12, that's actually caused a lot of contention among, um, you know, among scholars and Bible believers just on how to interpret it. Uh, and and you, you write a whole section in your book about it. Um, here's actually the passage. I'll read it so people at home know what we're talking about. Uh, so Revelation 12, it's, uh, what do we have here? One through seven, I believe. Mm -hmm. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and crying out, in uh, birth pains and the, and the agony of giving birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns on his head, uh, seven diadems. Uh, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devo devour it. She gave birth to a ma male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for uh, 1,260 days. Uh, all right, so there's obviously a lot to unpack there. Uh, just starting with like the first element here, what, what does the woman represent? Because that's something that's caused a lot of uh, yeah, the, differences. The, the woman, it, you know, for, for someone reading the book of Revelation, they would naturally think of one of two things. And as I talk about in the book, they're these two things sort of get conflated anyway, mm -hmm. but people might be inclined to think if they're a Christian, well, this is, you know, the Virgin, it's, it's Mary, you know, uh, a, a Jew would have thought of Israel because mm -hmm. Israel is described as a woman, you know, many passages in the Bible, you know, the, the, the bride of God and, and that sort of thing. So both of those things though, actually produce the Messiah. So it's kind of like six of one and a half dozen <laughs> of another, right. you know, depending on what uh, perspective that you're in. But I, I look at the passage and it, I, Believe it or not, sometimes the text means just what it says. <laughs> you, know, you know, John says, I looked up in the heavens and saw. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so he, he tells you what, what he's looking at. And we, we don't often, you know, approach Revelation this way because, you know, e either we're not sort of cognizant with the larger subject of genre of astral prophecy. And there is such a thing. Academics talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. But I think the greater disconnect, the one that most Christians actually ought to be responsible for, is what Paul does in Romans 10. And for me, this was sort of my link into this thinking where Paul is talking about, hey, you know, people need to hear about Jesus. They need to hear about the gospel. It's that famous passage that I'm sure we've all heard like 20 sermons <laughs> on, you know, how shall someone hear without a preacher and all that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Paul gets to a certain point where he says, you know, have they not all heard? And you expect him to say, no, that's why I'm preaching to you. Go out there and witness to people. But he actually says, indeed, they have. Hmm. And then his proof text in Romans 10, 18 is Psalm 19. He says his proof text is their voice goes out through all the earth. And if you what? go back and look where that comes from, it's, it's the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament, mm -hmm. you know, you know, declares his handiwork, shows his handy, all, all the, you have, you have celestial objects that are described with verbs of communication. Hmm in Psalm 19. And so for some strange reason, this becomes Paul's proof text for saying, yeah, everybody here should have heard that, you know, there was a, a divine king here, that the Messiah was here. Mm -hmm. And to us, that is a complete disconnect. Right. And I, and I, I can't necessarily prove that this is, was exactly what was in Paul's mind, but I think Revelation 12 does tell us, again, what Paul was thinking about, you know, what, what the Magi mm -hmm. actually saw. It, it was more than just one sign, okay, the, the star in Matthew 2. There are other things going on 
Now, the, Rev- the description of Revelation 12 helps us to explain mm-hmm. the star in Matthew 2, but there's a whole other complex of ideas involving the woman and a few other things that, you know, as, as you read through the passage, but I'm sure people picked up on. So these are actually like constellations and stuff that's being described here. Yeah, it, it's it, cool. I, I'm not a, I mean, this isn't original to me. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, there's a very uh, worthwhile book. Uh, I would get a later edition of it if you can, second or third edition. Uh, the Star That Astonished the World by Ernest Martin mm. uh, has done a lot of, a lot of really good work here. I don't, I don't agree with all of Martin's theology, mm-hmm. uh, but I think his case here is pretty compelling. Other astronomers have done you know, work using you know, his work in Revelation 12. But the, the, the notion was that you know, what John is describing very clearly, if you're thinking in these terms, is you have the woman who's the virgin about to give birth. Okay, the sun and the moon, okay, the sun is in her midst. This is, you know, classic astronomical, astrological language for the sun being in a constellation. Mm-hmm. People, people still use this terminology today. Mm-hmm. The moon is at her feet. Well, that's kind of easy to figure out. <laughs> if you start plotting this in an astronomy program, you know, which, you know, I've done, lots of other people have done. Mm-hmm. You notice other things that are going on. Okay, you've got two candidates for the dragon. Where there's one at her feet on the ecliptic, which is really interesting because the ecliptic is this imaginary line that goes through the heavens, mm-hmm. you know, that you know, astronomers use to map out the path of the constellations through the year. Uh, the Masoretic text in Psalm 19, Paul quotes the Septuagint. You know, their voice goes out through all the earth, but the, the traditional Hebrew text says their line Hmm. goes oh. out through all the earth. Wow. Which could, I think, is very clearly a reference to the ecliptic. So you, you got that going on. You know, you, you've got off the ecliptic, you've got another dragon constellation, Hydra, underneath it's Scorpio with the claws. We divide that up into Scorpio and Libra. Mm-hmm. But in the ancient world, that was one. It was, it was referred to as a dragon, you know, with the claws underneath. Huh. Above her head is Leo, which is the messianic, you know, the lion of Judah. Inside Leo, Leo, you have a, a conjunction of the king star, Regulus, with the king planet, Jupiter. Oh. And if you look at, uh, like, the, with the birth of Jesus, you know, every Christmas, you know, we hear, you know, stories about astronomers trying to figure out the star of Bethlehem. That's the dominant explanation, that it's Jupiter, because Jupiter has what's called retrograde motion. Mm-hmm. So it, it fits in with that. So, you, you know, a lot of people just fixate on that. And I, uh, all I'm suggesting is, well, maybe John actually meant what he said. When yeah. I looked up in the heavens and saw, because very clearly it's the Messiah. Mm-hmm. He, you know, she's giving birth to a child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron, quoting Psalm 2, a classic messianic text. And yeah, that's fascinating. That's awesome. yeah, it, it shows how when we try to take things out, like, you know, a lot of the church has done how much we really miss, uh, you know, when we call just a blanket statement, call everything astrology, we shouldn't have anything to do with that. Right. But when it clearly does say in the scripture, well, you know, yeah, we, we have to be careful. That... And, and, you know, Paul, Paul condemns, you know, pagan astrological practices right. and Galatians. Mm-hmm. And there are reasons that he does it. But then there are reasons that he's quoting Psalm 19, mm-hmm. which is, again, astronomical language as speaking to us about the birth of a Messiah. I mean, Paul, Paul does one and not the other. And then, well, why, you know, what, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. And again, if you study, you know, the subject matter, the differences become pretty clear. Yeah. It's fascinating. Well, we're, we want to let you know at home how you can get a hold of, uh, Dr. Michael Heiser's fantastic book, book, reversing hormone. Uh, so right after this, we'll be talking about the dragon, sea creatures and chaos. Stay tuned. (laughs) I will ascend into heaven. The war began in Eden when the dragon, known as Nakash, lured Adam and Eve into sinning with the lie, ye shall be as gods. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Soon, humans multiplied upon the earth, and rather than worship God, they fell down at the feet of dragons. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. But it wasn't enough for the dragons. They wanted to do more than just own mankind. They wanted to destroy them, to forever keep them from re-entering the divine council. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. The war raged on where fallen angels descended onto mountaintops, spreading fear and false doctrine. 
It is a war for the souls of men, and only a savior's blood could change the outcome. I will be like the Most High. Satan and his minions go by many names and wear many faces, but their strategy has always been to imitate God's truth. We call this war for men's minds the Great Inception. Learn the secret history of the spiritual war. Learn the names of the deceivers and what their true aims really are. Learn where they have struck and where they will strike again before it's too late. The Great Inception. We're in the middle of a battlefield surrounded by an enemy that we've been told doesn't even exist. The pagan gods are imaginary, we've been taught, just lifeless blocks of wood and stone. The Great Inception shatters that illusion. It took me two years to pull this information together, research into archaeology, history, ancient languages, to show that the Bible stories you've known since childhood are actually literal accounts of supernatural warfare between God and the rebel gods who decided to reject the authority of their creator. My hope is that after reading The Great Inception, you come away with just one question. Why haven't we heard this in church before? You've been fighting in a war against an enemy you've been told doesn't even exist. Skywatch TV wants to change that to prepare you for the battles ahead. Beginning March 7th, exclusively from Skywatch TV, the Cosmic War Collection finally arrives. Featuring three groundbreaking books, a five-hour DVD, and a seven-hour audio series showing you how real the supernatural war of kingdoms actually is. Reversing Hermon by acclaimed Bible and ancient language scholar Dr. Michael S. Heiser. And The Great Inception by Skywatch TV's Derek P. Gilbert. You'll learn how Christ's full mission has been misunderstood for 2,000 years. Not only did he come to shed his blood to redeem mankind, Jesus was on a mission to reverse the sin of the angelic watchers who descended on Mount Hermon. You'll also discover how Bible stories you've known since childhood were literal battles in the spirit realm between God and the gods who rebelled. When you order the Cosmic War Collection from Skywatch TV, you'll receive Reversing Hermon by Dr. Michael S. Heiser, The Great Inception by Derek P. Gilbert, a new, exclusive, never-before-offered deluxe hardcover collector's edition of the Book of Enoch. The Real Clash of the Titans DVD, a special never-before-released video compilation with five hours of teaching on the long war between God and the gods. And The Unseen Adversary, a brand new audio series on MP3 disc with seven hours of Derek P. Gilbert interviewing Dr. Michael Heiser on The Watchers, UFOs, and The Great Cosmic Rebellion of Satanic Forces. A value of more than $100, yours for just $29.95. The Cosmic War Collection, available beginning March 7th only from Skywatch TV. Know your enemy, order the Cosmic War Collection beginning March 7th by calling 844-750-4985 or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Welcome back to Into the Multiverse. We are speaking with Dr. Michael Heiser on his book, Reversing Hermon, specifically astral prophecy. Uh, now, you, you, you had a question about... Uh... Yes. Okay. And regarding the dragon, mm -hmm. a lot of people will say that it's Satan. Mm -hmm. But you have other information about sea creatures and chaos and Hydra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, I mean, John, again, is looking at the sky. He's looking mm -hmm. at the heavens. He's not looking into hell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, again, it's it's very clear that that when he when he's talking about the dragon, he's talking about something in the sky, and some of that you know gets associated with Satan because Satan in the larger scope of biblical theology is the one who is responsible for upheaval, all the things that are working against God and His people, you know, contrary to, to what God wants. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you look at, at the, the dragon discussion, there's really two options here. Uh, the, 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 the object on the ecliptic, the constellation on the ecliptic, uh, could be, you know, one candidate. And, you know, personally, you know, that, that one looks good to me because it's on the ecliptic. It's directly under, you know, the, the feet of the woman she's about to give birth, ready to devour the child. Well, the text, though, actually says that the dragon was 
you know, uh, in front of, okay, anopion is the Greek term there. So that can mean a front, in front of, beside, in the presence of. It's actually pretty, pretty variable. Hmm. So you could have the other option, hydra. What hydra, which is off the ecliptic to the side a little bit, what that one has going for it is that is the traditional ancient symbol for Leviathan. Mm. Mm-hmm. And we all know, again, at, le- at least people who are going to be watching this show and <laughs> Skywatch, we all know that Leviathan is, you know, again, this sort of classic chaos symbol that gets associated with the devil and mm-hmm. all that de- the devil's doing. You know, and is part of the day of the Lord judgment, uh, you know, where, you know, God's going to judge Leviathan and kill the beast with seven ho- you know, heads and horns and all. That's all Leviathan imagery. And that is set in the waters, the waters of chaos in the mm-hmm. ancient world. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, we, we, we get a lot of connections between those ideas and what John, you know, is actually seeing here. So it could be either, but the point is that there's a dragon and he's saying, this is, this is a threat, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and connecting it with Satan is very logical because again, God is bringing the Messiah through the Virgin into the world and he wants its destruction. Right. Okay. To, to, again, keep everything in upheaval, to prevent all of this stuff from being reversed Uh, in reversing Hermon, you know, the, the whole book is really about reversal themes. Mm-hmm. And this is part of the imagery because it doesn't really end with, with Satan. The, the, the part that you don't really pick up on, and you can get, kind of get lost in the dragon uh, mm-hmm. thing, is that if you look at it astronomically, there are things in the sky that would have been what the Magi saw at the birth that actually connect back to figures like Orion, hmm. Cassiel in yeah. Hebrew. And that takes you into the giant territory. Uh, there's, a, there's a Dead Sea Scroll text, a Targum of Job, that connects Orion with the Nephilim. Oh, wow. I mean, you, you get really interesting stuff uh, that, you know, we could, we could get into how it factors into flood chronology and Jewish traditions about how, you know, Noah had a particular birthday, Tishri one. If you plot this out, again, in an astronomy program, guess what? The Messiah shows up on Tishri one. Wow. Okay. It, oh, wow. There, there are just a number of things like this that if you were a Jew, mm-hmm. again, a, a literate Jew, not, you know, someone who hadn't spent any time in, in these texts, you would have looked at this and worked the numbers and thought, wow, Jesus and Noah share a birthday. <laughs> and Noah was here to, you know, be at the time, God's solution to the transgression of the watchers. Mm -hmm. And so this fits. The Messiah is supposed to reverse this as well. He's the ultimate, you know, firewall. He's the ultimate reversal against all of this bad stuff that has been accruing in the history of humanity. Wow. That, that's it, fascinating. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. What about the, uh, the, the wilderness and the 1,260 days? What, what, what is that all about? Yeah, it really depends, you know, on what eschatological system you're following. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's part of that larger question. If you're, uh, I guess, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to be use words that are kind of clunky, but uh, I'll use these because they're pretty descriptive. But if you're a, like a literalist, mm-hmm. uh, maybe a premillennial dispensationalist or something like that, you would be you would be looking at the 1260 as a time of you know persecution, protection from persecution, because we actually look at Revelation 12, the woman who is Israel mm-hmm. is being protected, you know, from the dragon. You would look at that as as you know part of the tribulation period where the, the Jews are under protection now, having gone into the tribulation, so on and so mm-hmm. forth. If you're not of that persuasion, then you're going to keep it with Israel of the first century when the Messiah was actually born. And mm-hmm. so you're going to have your own sort of timing out of events where you look at, you know, the Romans, you know, who are, you know, persecuting the people of God, not only just Jews, but early Christians as well. And so, you know, you look at that as a protection in the first century from different, you know, historical figures and events. Hmm. So it really just depends on what system. So can the entire book of Revelation, at least the prophetic, or yeah, the prophetic parts, be looked at uh, as astral prophecy? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. There, there's a well-known, uh, at least in academia, in New Testament scholarship, there, there's a well-known book called The Genre and Meaning of Revelation. It's by Bruce Malina. Mm-hmm. And Malina is a specialist in astral prophecy. He's really, a, a, even more than that, a specialist in what they call social scientific approach to the oh, New okay. Testament. Okay. So cultural stuff. Um, he tries to argue this point mm-hmm. that, that pretty much everything in Revelation can get filtered through ancient astronomy. 
I, I would say this. I, I think there's more to that than the average person or, or New Testament scholar would, would admit to. Mm-hmm. But I think Malina carries it a little too far because he more or less has to dispense with how the book uses the Old Testament in certain ways that are, that to me, it seemed pretty clear. So I would, I would be much more cautious you know, than he okay. is. Yeah. Are there other okay. areas outside of uh, Revelation 12 that might, might be like an astral prophetic thing? Or, uh... <clears throat> I, I think there are. You, know, you, you have the classic you know, situations in the Gospels where the day of the Lord is accompanied by celestial portents, you know, signs in the sky, the sign of the Son of Man, and, and all that. That's definitely astronomical, astrological, again, in, in their mm-hmm. thinking. And, and you know, again, astrology just means God is behind these things, these right. events. They're, it's it's sort of a theological spin mm-hmm. on you know what what you're looking at in the sky. Um, it's very general, though. For instance, we're never told what the sign of the Son of Man is. It could be two yeah. or three different things. So it lacks specificity, which is why I caution people, look, even if you can sort of, you have a lot of material here to deal with in Revelation 12. Don't assume, though, that Revelation 12 is a commentary on Matthew 24, Matthew 25, because mm-hmm. we're just not told that. So you can get into a lot of trouble date setting because mm-hmm. anything astronomical you can you can plot on a calendar. Mm-hmm. I mean, as as I do in the book, there is a there's it comes down to a ninety minute window for the birth of Jesus. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and the date is pretty significant. And it, on both calendars, secular calendar, Jewish calendar, and by in in our day and age, that the date is pretty significant too. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that, that that becomes a cipher mm-hmm. for other passages. That makes sense because we're we're just not told that information. Right. So, what is the true date of uh, Jesus' birth, and why is it significant? <clears throat> well, it, again, if if you if you take everything at, at face value, you come out with September eleventh wow. in three BC. Mm. Now, the main obstacle to that, as I point out in the book. Uh, that, that scholars, you know, sort of poo-poo that as well. You know, Her- we know that Herod died in 4 BC and, and, you know, he has to be dead after the birth. And <laughs> it's not actually true. There's been a lot of recent scholarship um, on Herodian chronology uh, in particular, and even Herodian coins that help establish chronology, that you can have a death of Herod, uh, depending on what calendar you use, in 1 BC. Hmm. Mm. So th- it's no obstacle uh, to an astronomical reading that, that I'm talking about in the book. Fantastic. Wow, that's well, cool. There's a lot of Bible passages that some of which we hear in church sometimes if we're lucky, some of which we don't, but we never really get the full story. That's what I love about your books and um, especially this this recent one and your podcast, by the way, which for people out there who have been following my ministry and, you know, know little things that I post here mm-hmm. and there, I, I don't ever post podcasts because I usually don't listen to them. Uh, when I <laughs> listen to a podcast, my mind wanders and I yes. can't retain anything. You know, I got to be watching something or reading something. But yours is one of the only ones that I actually the only one I can sit and listen to and Good. get a lot out of. So that's what I've been doing for um, th- this whole past week. One thing that's really interesting, uh, so I, I figure we could just go through some Bible verses and, and passages for the audience that, that may be familiar with some of these, um, but there's a lot to unpack in all these, so we probably won't get to all of them, but right. we can get through a few. Um, I figure we can just take them one at a time. That's I'll, fine. I'll, I'll take the first one. Go you right had the, ahead. You had the first question last time. So. I don't mind sharing. <laughs> <laughs> First Peter three eighteen through 22. Oh, yeah. What's going on here? I'll read it for the audience. Uh, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. This is also an antitype, which now uh, saves us baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. There's a lot going on there. And (laughs) this is one of the most confusing passages for even a lot of pastors. Yeah, this is, this is the one, if, if any of your listeners have read my book, The Unseen Realm, Mm -hmm. this is the passage where I relate the anecdote that I went to church one day (laughs) and I was excited because you know, he was going through the book of First Peter, and here we are. You know, yeah, because yeah. I love this passage. And he literally got up in the pulpit and said, "I have no idea what this means. We're just going <laughs> to skip it." 
Oh my god! At least he was honest. I, know, I, was like, I couldn't believe it. I, I've never heard or seen anybody do that. Oh my god! So I, I was offended. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the, the, there are some keys here. It, 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 it's strange, but it's really not that difficult if you make one or two little sort of mental adjustments. Mm -hmm. Now, the translation you quoted had the word anti-type in it, which is really important. Mm -hmm. The reference to the resurrection is important. The reference to being exalted above the principalities and powers is really important. What, what's going on here is, if you think, let, let's, let me use a, a more familiar example. In Paul in Romans 5 mm -hmm. talks about Jesus and Adam. Okay, he's, making, he's drawing some analogy there. And Adam, the text says at one point, is a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, a type, typology, is a nonverbal prophecy. Okay. Prophecy is something uttered about the future. A type would be an institution or an event or a person, again, that just prefigures something mm -hmm. to come. So Paul, is, his point is basically Adam, this, there's something going on about Adam and what Adam did that prefigured something that was going to happen later with mm -hmm. Jesus. Well, if you can understand that, when you go to 1 Peter 3, here's what you have to understand. Just as Adam was a type of Jesus for Paul, so Enoch is a type of Jesus for Peter. Hmm. Oh, okay. okay. Now, if you can make that adjustment... And if you knew the Watcher version, the Watcher story of what happens with Genesis 6 and the ultimate destiny, okay, of the, the fallen Watchers, you know, they're sent to the abyss and they're imprisoned, spirits in prison, second, you know, Peter, mm -hmm. Jude, all that language. If you know that backstory, then what Peter's doing is he's assuming his readers know the content like he does. Mm -hmm of the book of Enoch at this point, hmm. they know the story of the watchers and their transgression and what happened to them. And that for him prefigures something about Jesus. Hmm. Now the story as told in Enoch is e they, the watchers fall, they get sent to the abyss and now, Oh, we're sorry now because <laughs> Hey, we don't like this place. <laughs> and so, yeah, oops. and so they, they contact Enoch and they say, you, you know, God really likes you. you mm -hmm. know, so can you run interference for us and tell God we're sorry and we want to get out of here? And Enoch says, yeah, I'll do that. So he, you know, he, he, the story has Enoch going to God giving him the whole spiel and God says, yeah, forget it. Just yeah. Tell him that ain't going to happen. <laughs> the answer is no. Yeah. Then Enoch can, visits them in prison, in the abyss, in the underworld, okay? Mm -hmm. Announces their judgment to them again. And then that's that. Mm. So for Peter, it's like, well, when Jesus died and went into the afterlife, Sheol, the underworld, where everybody goes, he preaches to the spirits that are in prison. He, in other words, he has a message for the watchers. Mm -hmm. And just like the first one, this one ain't good either. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to make them happy. Okay. Because they're thinking if he shows up there, it's like, wow, somebody pulled it off. They got rid of the Messiah, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the game has changed. And Jesus is like, no, not so much. <laughs> okay. I'm here now, but I'm not going to be here very long. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so so it, it's really about theological messaging that gets connected to the resurrection. Mm -hmm. okay, the antitype is the resurrection. And and the whole thing about having the good conscience and, and, and whatnot is, again, I discuss this a lot in the book, that conscience there isn't this moral you know, gyroscope between right, or right and wrong. It's about a disposition of making a, a right choice. And the right choice in this case is embracing the news of, of the gospel and Jesus and the resurrection, you know, and that's how we're saved. But it, you know, it connects all these flood ideas, all, you know, stuff that's going on in Genesis six you know, with the spirits in prison, with being exalted above the principalities and powers. If you don't have the backstory in your head, mm -hmm. like Peter assumes you do, mm -hmm. this is going to look hopeless. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if you do, you know how to read him. In other words, you will know what he was trying to communicate. And it really turns baptism into spiritual warfare. That's awesome. Because when, when, you, when you get baptized, it's not only a public testimony to the people watching you. In some way, it's a re-telegraphing theologically of this is the side I'm on now. Mm -hmm. I am no longer owned by the Lord of the dead or if I'm a Gentile, by one of the, you know, the fallen sons of God. Okay, I am switching sides. Mm -hmm. So it reannounces their loss, their demise to them. 
Wow, that's wow, really cool. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, well, uh, there's another uh, <clears throat> passage to discuss about the head covering in uh, First Corinthians 11. <laughs> the, before, before you read that, too, <laughs> do we need to put up the parental yeah. advisor? <laughs> for, for those of you with kids at home, but th- th- this does get into odd territories. It does. But, uh, you know, like you said in the Skywatch program, we don't need to protect people from their Bibles. <laughs> you know? It is what it is. It's in the Bible. And, but anyway, go, Have go ahead. Have you read Songs of Solomon? Yeah. Have you read it? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I'll let you read the verse and then uh, Mike can tell us what it means. <laughs> okay, so 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 through 10 says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. For that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. If it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head since he is in the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman was created for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. And that, that last part there is <laughs> yes. really strange. What? Because of the what? Yeah, why yes. does, why does yeah. hair length have anything to yeah, do with... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's the dilemma. I mean, we, we've obviously, you know, church traditions have taken this a number of different ways um, in the past. I, I have a whole chapter on this, obviously, in reversing hormone. Uh, we did this on my podcast. With I listened to it. It was awesome. Okay. I, I think it was like episode 86 or something yeah. like that. That was actually the first episode of your podcast I listened to. Oh, well, I, it blew me away. It was, was great. I was going to say, if that didn't drive you away, nothing. <laughs> 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 but I mean, what, what's going on here, this is going to sound like, I'll say it just like I said in the podcast, this is going to sound like the most ridiculous thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when you understand what it means it actually makes everything in the passage sort of fall together. Yeah. Now, you have to ask yourself, what, what is going on with the head covering and the angels? It just doesn't, it, it just sounds goofy. Well, mm-hmm. what I do in, in the book in this chapter is I draw on some recent uh, scholarly research, you know, some journal articles about this issue. And the, the one particular one latches on to the Greek word for head covering, parabolion. Mm-hmm. And he happens to notice, and again, I, I know who this guy is, and his, his doctoral work is in Greco-Roman medical texts. Doesn't that sound fascinating? <laughs> but he noticed that it's the same term that is used in these medical texts, like Hippocrates, mm-hmm. okay, we, we all know the Hippocratic Oath, mm-hmm. for testicle. Mm. Mm. And, and he's like, what, what's up with that? And, yeah. and, and, the, <laughs> and the, the short version of it is, this goes back to, medical thinking of the first century <clears throat> that the parabolion, uh, you know, does in fact refer to, refer to the pubic region or, or testicles. Mm-hmm. And you'll find this in, in medical texts strewn all over the ancient world. So it, when, when it gets to Paul, Paul draws on that. And also, also in medical texts, you have the idea that women's hair and specifically long hair mm-hmm has something to do with female fecundity, the ability to conceive. And the idea was, and again, this sounds like crazy town to us because we, we're modern, you know, we, right. we, we, we do science here. <clears throat> if a woman had long hair, when, dur- you know, after sex, when the, you know, the, the, the man has ejaculated into her, if the, the longer her hair was, the hair, the role of the hair was to draw that up into the uterus mm-hmm. so that she could conceive which again sounds totally bizarre. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a shame for a man to have long hair for the opposite reason. The man's job was to deposit you know, mm-hmm. the, the sperm in the woman to have children. And so if a man had long hair, that would prevent him from being fertile. Mm. Oh, okay. Because his job was to eject, not retain. Okay. Whereas mm. the woman's job was retained and their, their anatomy, the hair in this case, was thought to be key, crucial, to retention, you know, as opposed to ejection. And so that's why you get all this long hair talk. And, and, and I go th- in the book, I go through a bunch of passages in ancient medical texts that, that show that this is the point. Mm-hmm. Well, if you take that back to what Paul's saying here, his talk about the head covering serves two purposes. One is modesty. Well, of course, you wouldn't leave your hair uncovered in church because the hair is equated with 
again, sexual ability, the mm -hmm. ability to conceive it. It's personal, it's private, it's part of the private parts, you know, that kind of thing. So of course you don't have your hair uncovered in church. That's just immodest. Mm. And you need something, you know, to cover this part of you, you know, to, to show that you were, you know, married, your, your sexual relationship is, you know, contained within marriage here. Mm -hmm because of the angels. Mm. Well, what, what's up with that? Yeah. Well, Paul is drawing on this notion that women had been taken advantage of sexually by angels. Mm -hmm. Well, where's the only place you're going to find that? <laughs> Back at the Watcher story, Genesis 6. So as strange as it sounds, Paul was concerned that if, if, if women, again, you know, if they don't, you know, behave in a certain way in church, that that's bad. That's mm -hmm. going to cause problems. And if they're not, you know, under the, the headship, the lordship, you know, the you know, of the marital bond, they, they, they let it be known that they have a specific husband and then they, they guard themselves by, again, what they're doing with their hair, mm -hmm. that that's going to leave them vulnerable. And we don't ever want to see this thing happen again. Mm -hmm. So in Paul's mind, he considered this apparently something that could happen again. He doesn't say it did. Right. He's not predicting anything, mm -hmm. but, but it was a concern, but it was a concern for him. We don't want, you know, to draw attention in this way to the angels mm. because they, they fell once before they could do it again. Wow. Wow. It, it, it's interesting. It, yeah. It's amazing how, uh, how, if we just put off this idea that because I've, I've heard, I, I haven't heard any specific sermons on that, but usually church kind of ignores it. But if, if, if anything is said, it's more of like a traditional thing. Mm -hmm. Like, well, because the Bible says so, women have to have long hair and men should not have long hair mm -hmm. because the Bible says so. And then it just goes no further. Right. But right. it's really interesting when you think about what their reasoning for that right. was. It, it had a context. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting. So that's, that's interesting. There, um, there are even places, and I, again, I, I cite these in the book where... And, and I, you know, I, I give people all the sources. They can go back and, and look at the article if they yeah. want. Or the podcast where even tests for infertility mm -hmm. for women involved hair. Wow. So it, it's, it's very clear of you know, what they were thinking. It's just that Paul takes the idea and applies it in a different way to the Corinthian situation. Hmm. So it, it all has a context for that's it. That's so yeah. cool. That, yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting, interesting too how Enoch ties into all that. Uh, the lake of fire, Matthew twenty five forty one, uh, says, uh, Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In a biblical context, there's some stuff we can glean there, but what about Enoch? What, what, what does Enoch have to tell? What, what's the what's yeah. story here? I mean, if you've ever asked, Ask yourself the question, okay, where, do, where does Matthew get this idea? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you, you look back in your Old Testament and you really can't find it. You mm -hmm. know, this idea of the, the devil and his angels. You yeah. Know, you, you, sure, you have references to Satan. Uh, you never have Satan, you know, discussed in the Old Testament where he has like buddies, you know, like, <laughs> right. like, like a, a, a gang that works with him. Right? You, you, you never have this. You never have the, the mention of a lake of fire. Mm -hmm. uh, so where does this collection of ideas come from? And the, the actual honest answer is this is a good instance in Matthew and other places where it's very clear that they're reading the books of Enoch, yeah. you know, first Enoch specifically and other Enochian material. And which is why you know, I made it part of the book that, that, it's very clear that they were drawing on, on a, a set of ideas that if you, if you sort of know how they were thinking about it, the only way you're going to know that is if you had read Enoch. Mm -hmm. But if you had read that, then you can go back to your Old Testament and go, oh, okay, here's how they took this passage and married it to that one. You know, the Rephaim and Sheol, yeah. the bad guys are there and it's a, you know, it's a fiery place. And I mean, you can see the, how the parts are assembled. Mm -hmm. It's just, we don't get that in the Old Testament. We get that in a book like First Enoch. And, and that's why when Matthew and others draw from that, people know, they, they, they get what they're talking about mm -hmm. because that material was familiar to them. Whereas us, you know, as modern Christians, um, Enoch and Enoch in material like the Book of the Giants or whatever, that, that is totally off the radar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for us. And so, you know, I, as I try to make the case in the book that, look, you don't have to consider First Enoch canonical, like right. it should be in the Bible. I, I don't. Uh, but to me, the question, that question isn't even important. You should read it and know it pretty well, because if you do, there will be places in the New Testament 
that you'll be reading something and you'll track on something that you know, okay, this is going to be linked back to this other thing that isn't in my Bible, but it's evident that the writer read this and, mm -hmm. and wrote about it. Mm -hmm. It informed what he was doing. And so if I can understand that, this helps me understand what the biblical writer wanted me to get. Right. In other words, I won't miss it mm -hmm. or I won't substitute something else in its place. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm going to be able to understand what he said in context because I have the, this backdrop now. Was the book of Enoch, was that something that first century Jews considered canonical or, or as mm -hmm. uh, like everything in there is as trustworthy as say like the book of Isaiah or, or anything that we mm -hmm. would consider? Or was it just something that was just more popularized? And Yeah, it, it, it was, there were... There were some Jews who quoted it as scripture. Mm -hmm. In other words, they used the same formulaic language as it says or as it is written. They'll use that of biblical material and then Enoch too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there, that does happen. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Uh, same thing with the early church. You know, you had a few defenders of Enoch. You know that, that it should be in our New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the book, in reversing Hermon in the back, I have a whole appendix of this discussion, you know, Jewish groups. And, and I give you the citations. I give you the, the primary texts of where Enoch was quoted as scripture by early Jews, early Christians, and sort of, you know, so people are familiar with the debate, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, uh, I, I can't remember. I think it was either Irenaeus or Tertullian toward the end of his life, uh, more or less said, you know, Hey, I've been defending this thing <laughs> the, the whole time. And, I'm looking around and I'm getting old and nobody's really buying it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I must be wrong. Right, right. Well, and that's what he said. He said, he said, they assumed that the Holy Spirit would guide his people en masse toward the truth, toward mm. what they should recognize as canonical. And, and he admitted that, you know, we're, that hasn't happened with Enoch, so it's okay with me. I'm, I'm, I'm giving it up. I'm not going to worry about it. And, and that, if you really think about it, that's really a good attitude, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, to have. And, but there were some you know, who really defended it at that level. But again, to me, the question is sort of a distractor. Uh, don't worry about the old debate or generating a new debate. You know, should we have Enoch in our, in our Bible? Just go read the thing. Yeah. yeah. We because have it, access it's going to gonna it. help you understand a number of passages. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll wow. let you take that last one about... Uh, Okay. Uh, well, I, going back to First Corinthians, this time chapter 15, verse 53, talks about our new bodies. Um, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it saying about our new bodies here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a whole um, lengthy discourse, not, not just in material that we would either consider biblical or, you know, kind of right up against, you know, stuff that links into the Bible, but the whole secular Greek mm -hmm. uh, tradition. To them, the, the, the phrase spiritual body was not an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. They believe that this, this other body, and again, it's even hard to talk about it, but this, this other body was actually made of something. Right. It, it was made of stuff mm. mm -hmm. and that was celestial stuff. It wasn't, oh, wow. it wasn't human stuff. It was more than human stuff. And some of the vocabulary Paul uses in first Corinthians 15 is drawn right out of that discussion. So his readers again would have known that he's not talking about believers becoming, you know, ethereal spirits that, mm -hmm. you know, float around in the quantum world or something. Right. Like that. <laughs> you know, even though he went, even though, deities, divine beings in, in these religions outside the Bible had those capacities to move beyond what we thought were our boundaries, you know, our physical boundaries. They could still do that, but they were still made of something and that something could be corporeal. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and again, as odd to our ears as that seems, that's really what Paul is drawing on. And I, I think even more tellingly in biblical theology, if you think again, back to Eden, okay, where did all this start? This started, uh, as I talk about an unseen realm a lot, where God wanted to have a human family. Mm -hmm. But the human family was, his purpose was to integrate the human family with the divine family. Uh, Eden was where God lived. Eden was God's headquarters, that sort of thing. God wanted a blended family with one purpose. And that was to serve him and make this place like 
Eden was, you mm-hmm. know, to spread his goodness and his glory. And he tasks them with, you know, the humans with that task. He has divine beings that are disembodied or could take on bodies doing things in their own realm. What was supposed to be one family ultimately where humanity, even though not created like one of them, you know, to like to be one of them would actually enter into that, that ontology. Mm. They would actually become divine. And of course they fail mm-hmm. uh, in Eden. But what Paul's saying is, look, there's going to come at some point, and, and the crucial point here is, is the resurrection of Jesus, because Jesus did get a body. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, was, it was the same Jesus, yes, it's not a different Jesus, it's Jesus. <laughs> but his flesh is now celestial flesh. Mm-hmm. And that is going to be transmitted and given to us so that we, just like we were intended to be, we will be divinized, we will be made divine, we will be integrated into the divine family and have bodies still, but something beyond human bodies. Mm -hmm. So it's another way of Paul saying, it's going to come full circle. It will come full circle, just as what, you know, what was intended will come to pass. And this is the linchpin event that makes it possible. Wow. That's, that's that's awesome. awesome. So what, in your view, there's, there's been a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people not to be insulting, but I think that like j- just because the church has done what it's done, <laughs> I think a lot of Christians have almost this cartoonish version of what happens when you die, mm-hmm. you know, what, what heaven is like or what it's like to be with God. In your opinion, and I know a lot of this is probably going to be speculation, but, you know, we're drawing from mm-hmm. things. In your opinion, when you die, what happens? Yeah, <clears throat> I think to be, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're, we, we have some sort of embodied existence because mm. of the way the dead are talked about. Mm. You know, they see each other. I mean, you got to be something in front of you to see. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, and, and it's difficult even for scriptural writers because they're, they're talking about a realm and an existence that is foreign, yeah. totally foreign mm-hmm. to their own. Um, and they, ha- they're, they have to use space-time language with, you know, latitude and longitude and you know, embodied existence to do it. So mm-hmm. it's a tough job, but I, I, I do think, you know, we're, we're with the Lord ultimately, whether we get a, an upgrade, you know, on, on whatever that body is at the end or not, I, I don't necessarily know. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I tend to think that when we exist as glorified believers on the new earth, okay, that might be different just because heaven isn't the new earth mm-hmm. yet. I mean, they're, Obviously, it's like <laughs> two things that are intimately related, but they don't have to be exactly the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, ultimately, we are the ones who displace and replace the, the fallen gods of the nations. Okay, this is, you know, when it, people, you know, when I get into this, I have to assume that they know a little bit about the Deuteronomy 32 worldview and right. cosmic geography and things like that. But Well, luckily, we did a whole program <clears throat> yeah. the last time you were here on that. Yeah, that, that's true. So ho- hopefully people, you know, caught that. But you know, the the other nations were put under other gods and they, they rebelled. They're in rebellion. They have to be judged. That's what Psalm 82 is about. And ultimately they will be displaced. There's a reason why when Paul talks about the resurrection, go check it out. Mm -hmm. When Paul talks about the resurrection, the way we hear it preached is, oh, I get a new body. And that's true. Paul does, does talk about that. But there are half dozen passages where Paul in the same breath as resurrection talks about either Jesus or us or both being exalted above the principalities and powers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's not an accident because in Paul's mind, the resurrection is the thing that delegitimized the gods of the nation so that the Gentiles could, could confidently say, We're, we get to go back into the family. Mm-hmm. We get to rejoin the people of God you know, that the strongholds are broken, all all this sort of thing. And he connects that with with their loss of their populations through the gospel and also ultimately their destruction Mm -hmm. in the day of the Lord, which is why Paul says, you know, hey, don't you know that you're going to rule over angels? If you know about the divine council hierarchy, the three-tiered sons of God, the family term is Mm -hmm. in the middle. You know, Moloch is is a lower term. These are the ones that occupy the nations or are supposed to, you know. Again, there's there's this whole backdrop, but Paul says, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? You're going to rule over angels? John in in Revelation 2 and 3 says, to him that overcomes, I will put him over the nations. Mm -hmm. It's not a throwaway line. It's saying you, believers, are going to displace and replace the fallen beings that are, that have, 
you know, charge of these nations now. You're going to be not only in my family, again, made part of the divine family as originally intended, but you get to occupy this, this task role. And you say, well, you know, what does that mean? Well, it means a whole lot more than harps and floating <laughs> on clouds and singing eight, 18 million choruses of just as I am. Okay? Right. <laughs> it means you're going to be busy. It means the heaven is going to be like Eden was, what was, and, and the earth was supposed to be, mm-hmm. and there will be a lot to, to do there. There'll be a lot to enjoy there. Mm-hmm. There'll be relationships between, you know, God's, you know, risen imagers. Uh, you know, I, I think to have a new earth, you're going to have it repopulated as Eden with animal life and plant life. And mm-hmm. there's a reason why it's described this way at the end. You, we're we're going we're gonna to serve God however he wants us to serve and maintain this place and enjoy him forever. That, 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 wow. was, that was the original plan. Mm-hmm. So everything goes full circle. And John has this throwaway line in there, there is no more sea. Yeah, what's that Again, all about? Because the sea is a chaos image. Wow. There's oh. no more chaos. There's no more disruption. There is nothing left to disrupt and be an affront to God. Mm-hmm. Nothing is going to go wrong again. Wow. You know, it, it's very intentional. You know, scripture is often, I, th- I think we, we kind of underestimate how intelligent, <laughs> <laughs> you know, biblical writers actually were because look at what they do. They're repurposing Old Testament material all the time. Yeah. Again, it's under inspiration and, and, and God uses them as instruments to do this. But the thoughts are so interconnected where if, if you don't know parts of your Old Testament and if, if you divorce parts of your Old Testament and your New Testament from material that the writers knew and, and you know, used to help them express a particular idea, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to get glimpses of what the text means, but you're never going to be able to see it as the writers wanted you to see it, right. as God wanted you to see it, because he's the one that picked them to do this job and providentially gave them the, the experience, the education, the exposure to this, that, and the other thing. He's the one that providentially set them up, prepared them for that time and place where he prompted them through the spirit that says, you better write this down. <laughs> you know, we, we, we just get a, a, a dim glimpse of that without all of this other material. So mm-hmm. it's important you know, yeah. to, to try to get as much of that in your head as you can and read scripture you know, through the eyes of the biblical person who didn't live today. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're just, we're so disconnected from that. And, you know, we just, our, our task is to try to, you know, capture as much of that as we can and take advantage of it. Yeah, absolutely. It, do, it does fill in a lot of blanks and it teaches us a lot of things yeah. that we don't learn in the church. Well, I do have just one more question. Um, Cause you, you said something earlier that, that I really like that you don't want to protect people from their Bibles. And I, I think that that's really profound. Um, what would you want the viewer most to take away from this program and from your, your new book and really just from all your work? <clears throat> I, I really want people to be more interested in the text, the biblical text, than they are interested in perpetuating a particular Christian subculture, even if they really like it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and, and it, it floats their boat and they enjoy it. That all, that's all good. But your task as a member of the family of God, as a, as a redeemed person, your task is to perpetuate not a denomination. It's to perpetuate the kingdom of God on this planet mm-hmm. and, and see the program through to its ultimate, you know, end times end. And, and to basically, if I could quote Bill Belichick here, just do your job. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> just do your job. And, and you, I think if we're text oriented, if we're focused on scripture and what it can sustain, then we can be charitable toward people who you know, might take this or that passage a different way. Okay, I can see where you could get that. You're mm-hmm. still rooted in the text, even though I have some other position. But if we're all about, oh, my tradition doesn't say that. Mm-hmm. My pastor doesn't say that. <laughs> okay, that, that's just a distraction. Mm-hmm. You know, what are you here for? Did Jesus die for you to perpetuate your subculture? <laughs> yeah. Or did he die to take over the planet? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it really comes down to that. So you got to land somewhere and I hope you land, you know, at, at the ladder. Yeah. You know, that's just biblical theology. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Well, if people want to know more about you or your work, where can they go? drmsh.com is my homepage since we brought up the podcast. I'll give that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nakedbiblepodcast.com. By the way, uh, the term naked Bible, uh, <laughs> it, the, 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 the inference there 
is we just try to do the Bible without you know, filtering it through creeds and subcultures, denominational yeah. traditions. We, we just try to do the text. So nakedbiblepodcast.com, those are the two main uh, sites. Fantastic. Awesome. And awesome. of course, we absolutely re recommend all of Michael Heiser's work, but make sure you uh, definitely pick up Reversing Hermon. And um, you can, we went through all the information on that on how to get a hold of that in the trailer and commercial that you saw earlier. Uh, so all that being said, I want to thank you all for joining us in this very special episode of Into the Multiverse. As always, take care and God bless.